Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. The election campaign has started and the race to be First Minister has begun. Today we are joined by current First Minister and leader of Welsh Labour, Mark Drakeford, as part of this series. Thank you for being with us today, Mark. First question I'd like to ask you is, do you like being the front man of a national campaign? Um, well, I, I, I have a normal ambivalences about it, you know. Um, it's, it's an important and necessary part of, uh, of the job and I've had to do it for the whole of this uh, 12 months and more. So in that sense, of course, uh, I do like being out there talking to people, all of that. I'm, uh, I'm not great at telephone canvassing as, as we have to do it, but I, uh, being on the doorstep uh, and just meeting people and talking to people, I enjoy all of that. Am I a natural front of stage person? Uh, not always. <laughs> How different have you found this election period so far compared to all the other ones? Because oh, well, it's completely different, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, absolutely. It is entirely different, isn't it? You know, normally we would have been uh, in my own part of the world in Cardiff West. We normally would start door knocking for an, a May election in January. We'd, we'd take some time at, at weekends and we'd go to different parts of the constituency and just have a couple of hours out doing it, and none of that has been possible at all. Even even in leafleting, we've not been able to do. So it's we've relied, as everybody else has, on all the other things you can do, the social media stuff, the uh, the, the material you can get out to, through people's doors. I mean, you know, I am very lucky in you know, in that sense that because of the nature of the pandemic and the interest there has been in people in what the Welsh Government is doing and the decisions we have to make. Um, I don't suppose there will be very many people in Cardiff West who don't know who their Senate member is. Uh, I, I imagine being a new candidate in these circumstances is even more challenging. Sure. To get people to, to hear from you or know what you're about. Uh, from the interactions you've had, is the thing that people are judging, well, you and the party on, mostly the pandemic response? Or do you think there is an aspect of it being Labour's record in government as well? Um, I think it's two things that I, uh, I'm at on this. I think the election is not so unusual. I think elections are always about your record. People always want to think about what you have done in government. Uh, but I think they are more about what people think about the future. So I think when people cast their, their vote, yes, they, they are reflecting on, on the experience. Uh, but I think it's like 60-40, really. I think they, they are more thinking about who do they want to be in charge from now on? Uh, what does a vote for this party mean? Uh, as far as, you know, my future, the future of this community, the future of Wales. So I think it'll be, I think it'll be that combination always. Is there anything during the, the 22 years of Labour government in Wales that you think could have been done better? Oh, God. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> of course. Uh, I think if, you know, in, in, a, in a slightly bigger sense, when I look back, I think I wish we'd made more of the first decade when the budget available to the Welsh Government went up in real terms every single year. And if you remember in the health field, we had Peter Townsend and the Townsend Review and you know a formula that allowed us to move money from parts of Wales where health was already better to parts of Wales where health was less good. Uh, and we did it, but we did it incrementally and we did it by differential distribution of the growth that we had in uh, in the budgets and, you know, uh, I think if we'd realised that the next decade was going to be a decade of shrinking budgets, then we would have pressed on. We would have pressed on more radically because I suppose we, we hoped that, you know, we would have been able to do it more incrementally over a longer period of time. But the, the road ran out sooner than we had realised. Obviously, the, the pandemic is probably not how you thought you were going to spend uh, a large proportion of your time as First Minister. Where would you have focused had it not been for the pandemic? What sort of policy areas and what sort of decisions do you think you would have made uh, about Wales' future had that pandemic not occurred? 
Well, um, part of the reason why I decided to be a candidate for the leadership of the Labour Party was uh, because we were dealing and have had to deal all the way through with that other great sort of you know existential uh, decision, which was to leave the European Union. I always thought that was going to be a huge challenge for us, and I, I thought that I. You know, the experience I had and the jobs that I've done meant that I would be in a position to help us to, to navigate a way through that. So even without the pandemic, we would have been dealing all the time with the Brexit consequences. And they are consequences which are direct in terms of the economic harm uh, that it will do to Wales. But it also has, you know, profound social consequences for a, on the whole, you know, Wales has been, I think, a, a united place. Wales has never voted for the Tories ever since universal suffrage and as always the debate has always been between uh, progressive parties of the sort of centre, the centre left. But Brexit set, set a sort of boat through Wales and created a division that I think was quite different and unlike the way we've, we've normally been. So as well as the economic consequences there were, there are the social and community consequences. So we've had to deal with those as well, but our ability to deal with them in the way we would have done has been very much, uh, you know, the, the scope has been narrowed by the pandemic. Uh, but I would have wanted to have spent more time on the bread and butter issues that have ended up being squeezed out of uh, our programme. So, for example, I was very sorry when we had to make a decision not to take forward a bill which would have brought buses back under uh, control of the public interest in Wales. You know, a, a, a radical proposal that would have you know, reversed the damage that the Thatcher deregulation of bus services has caused here in Wales. We invest huge amounts of public money uh, in bus services in Wales, and yet the public interest in the organisation of bus services is felt very weakly. We could have put that right. We would have put it right. The pandemic just meant that there wasn't scope to, to do it in the way that we, we had planned. So there are a series of quite bread and butter things, you know, in the transport field, in the housing uh, field that I would have wanted us to get on with. We would have succeeded in getting the community bank over the line had we had the capacity to have put the time into it that it needed and in the end that's just eluded us and that will happen now the other side of the election but loads of those relatively bread and butter but collectively uh, radical ways of making a difference. Speaking about plans for the other side of the election there's a few people who I've seen call your electoral pledges an ambitious. Obviously, you probably don't agree with that. Do you think that they show an ambition for Wales? Uh, absolutely, uh, I do. I think, uh, I, frankly, I think it is nonsensical to describe them in that way. And they often, if they are described in that way, it is by people whose uh, idea of ambition is very disconnected uh, from credibility. Uh, the thing about the Labour manifesto is, is that it is always subject to a degree of scrutiny that no other, no other party's manifesto ever gets in Wales. And I understand why that is the case, is, you know, that because uh, people think there is a reasonable expectation that one way or another the Labour Party will play a party in the government after the election. I don't share that, that taken for granted sense of it myself at all. But I think because people think that, you know, you're likely to be in it, then your ideas, quite rightly, get subject to scrutiny. And that means they've got to be deliverable. They've got to be credible. It's very easy to write uh, ambitions that have no chance at all of being realised and call and, and say, what an ambitious list you've, you've created. Unfortunately, it's just a list that has no bearing on people's, uh, the reality of people's lives. So our, I think our pledges are genuinely ambitious. They start with the recovery from the pandemic, the investment we will have to make in the health service and in the lives of our young people, it offers a guarantee to our young people. I was just determined. You know, I am, I am, as all of us, you know, influenced by our histories. I came to Cardiff in 1979 
Uh, I spent that dismal decade of the 1980s working on the Ely estate in Cardiff as a probation officer. Uh, I was uh, an unusual uh, person in the probation office because I, I wanted to work with young people. I've always enjoyed working with adolescents. I like I like their truculence. I like their I like their cussedness and all of that. Um, but it, that wasn't uh, that wasn't that common uh, amongst my uh, my fellow probation officers. So I, I worked with young people for the decades, and I used to spend my time saying to them, you know, you know go to school, sit that exam, go on that course. You know, if you do the right things, then there's a path for you to the sort of future you want. And they would look back at me with a sort of well, I don't believe it, look in their eyes. And that's because, you know, there was a government that was prepared to sacrifice them, thought they were expendable in the Thatcherite economic experiment. Young people were collateral damage. And I feel so determined that that will not happen here in Wales uh, after the pandemic. And that guarantee for young people that, you know, the gap that's going to be there between now and when the economy properly recovers will be filled in Wales by things that only governments can do to create genuine opportunities for young people. So when the upturn comes, they're better equipped than they would be otherwise to take advantage of it. I don't think that's uh, lacking ambition. And I think it's bang slap where it needs ambition to be. You talk about the scrutiny that your manifesto gets compared to the other parties. Do you ever get a little bit frustrated or annoyed that the other major political parties in Wales seem to be able to uh, say what they want because they know that it's going to be unlikely for them to be part of the government or leading a government, yeah. puts you under more pressure. I, I do think they get away with it in Wales. I think in other places with a, you know, a, more, uh, a, a more vibrant uh, media, then those ideas will be subject to scrutiny in the way that they, they don't get in Wales. That's part of the the lack of depth in our uh, in our media landscape in Wales. I think in Scotland, the level of Scottish Indigenous media they have means that all parties get scrutinised. Uh, but I but I'm, uh, I don't I don't think of that as a reason for us not being scrutinised. You know I mean, I, I think it's right and proper, and our manifesto is constructed to stand up to examination. We have spent weeks and weeks and weeks testing every idea we put in there to make sure that we can defend it, explain it, fund it and deliver it. And I do think there are other parties who feel not under quite the same pressure to test every line in Vegas. Um, there's no mention in those pledges on electoral or Senate reform. Will there be any more detail on that in the manifesto? There will be a whole chapter in the manifesto on those uh, constitutional uh, type issues. Pledges are, are there to uh, attract the interest of you know, the widest possible uh, group of people in Wales. And while some of us have spent probably far too much of our lives uh, being interested in electoral systems and constitutional relationships and all of that, you know, it's not that there isn't an interest in those things in Wales, there patently is. Uh, but I don't think it lends itself to the sort of pledge-type territory. Are there any non-devolved areas uh, where you would love to have done something in this manifesto if you had the power to do so? Yes, yeah, of course uh, there are. Look, I'll, I'll give you the most obvious. It, it'll, it'll link back to uh, what I said a, a moment or two ago. I have, a, I have a vivid memory of being sent to City Hall in Cardiff in probably... 1995 to give evidence to Labour's Constitutional Commission on behalf of the National Association of Probation Officers. Uh, and I was there with the document trying to persuade the Labour Party to make devolution a part of the justice system, part of the responsibilities of the original National Assembly. And here we are 20 years uh, on and you know we're not a step further forward in that. It makes no sense to me that youth justice is not devolved uh, to Wales. Almost everything you do as a youth justice worker depends upon a devolved service. Makes no sense that the probation service is not devolved to Wales. We would not have made the dreadful, dreadful, you know, sort of cowpotch, as I'm sure we would have said in command, and a uh, mess of, of the probation service if we'd had it here as a public service in Wales. So yes, you know, there are, there are parts of the manifesto quite certainly where 
we would have been able to do more, would have had more ambitious things we could have said if we had had the powers directly to do them. In your leadership election in 2018, you said that clear red water was no longer necessary. Do you believe that still to be the case? Well, uh, I, I was probably answering the question in the context probably. of the national leadership of the Labour Party at the time. Mm. And the fact that I was making a lot of uh, speeches about Labour's election manifestos, national leadership manifestos, pointing out all the things that were in them that we'd already done in Wales. Uh, so what I was pointing to was the fact that, you know, the, the gap had narrowed because the National Labour Party was closer uh, to us than it uh, probably was back in 1999 and the year 2000. Uh, I still think it is very important that we have a distinctive Welsh Labour approach to the issues that face us uh, as a nation, because there are constitutional issues that we have to grapple with because the nature of Welsh society, the fact that we are a, a bilingual nation with a history and a geography and a politics that is different. So the distinctive nature, if that's what, you know, clear in what it was an attempt to express, the distinctive nature of Welsh policy making. Uh, and I still think that is very important. I still think that it is uh, demonstrably there to be done. And, you know, at, uh, at various points over the last 12 months, as well as having difference uh, of approaches with uh, the UK government, we've uh, occasionally, not often, but occasionally, we've had a difference of view to the UK Labour Party as well, and uh, that always gets me into trouble in the sense I'm always having to you know, answer questions and defend it, but on the whole, I think that is healthy. Are you at all concerned about people in the Labour Party who are pushing for Welsh independence? There's polls showing it as over 50%. Does that at all concern you at all? Um, well, uh, I think that is a reflection of the last 12 months and the extent to which the Welsh government has been able to use the independent powers that are already available to us and to use those powers in an independent way. You know, we've, we've made difficult decisions, but where we've been convinced that they are the right decisions, even when nobody else is making them, even when, you know, Scotland... England and Northern Ireland are doing something different. If we felt it's right for Wales, we've done it. And I think that has, you know, created an appetite uh, amongst people to be able to go on doing things in that way. You know, I, I'm a Devo Max uh, person. I believe in strong and entrenched devolution. Uh, I think that the way to secure the future of the United Kingdom is to regard, it, you know, it has four countries choosing to pool our sovereignty for particular purposes. Uh, all of that is, you know, a very different model to the one we have today. But it stopped short. And I think, you know, for very, very good reasons, it stopped short of thinking that Wales would be better off if we sawed ourselves, you know, down off as dyke and floated off into the Irish Sea. Uh, I think the minute, the minute you have conversations with people, you begin to ask them quite simple questions, like, just explain to me what currency we will be using in Wales once, once we are independent in the way you say we should be. What, what will I be getting my, uh, you know, what will my wages arrive in? What will I be buying big beans with? Uh, it's, it's funny how quickly, you know, even a simple question as that causes people who offer you the slogan uh, find it difficult to offer you what lies behind it. Although it's, I'm guessing certainly not your desired outcome. The recent polls have sort of shown that maybe a coalition would be necessary to form the next Welsh government. Do you think there's sufficient common ground between you and other progressive parties in Wales to form the basis of a coalition agreement? Uh, well, you, you, will, you will have to expect me to give you the normal uh, yes. <laughs> you know, uh, footnotes to this, that uh, you know we will be working to secure every vote in every seat and uh, that I think a, a stable Labour government in this crisis is what would offer people in Wales the best way through it all. But the history of devolution is, is that it is very difficult indeed. No party has ever secured a majority in our electoral system. And I have worked in governments 
with members of uh, Plaid Cymru, the Liberal Democrats, and uh, um, people who have not been in any party at all. Um, what has always matters to me is the programme, the policy programme. It, you know, if we need to work with uh, other parties, then I, I'm not interested in political fixes. I'm not interested in approaching it on a, a, a who gets what sort of basis. The reason we've had successful governments with other parties is that we've started with hammering out a common policy platform that different parties can sign up to. I spent the summer of the year 2000 going every Saturday down to the Bay to meet a man called Michael Hines, who was the senior advisor in the Liberal Democrat Party. And, you know, entirely the two of us, we worked our way through policy positions, which we were, in, in the end, in the autumn, able to present to the First Minister, to Mike German as leader of the Liberal Democrats as, you know, not the, not the done deal in any way. There were lots of issues still to sort out, but the, the solid basis for a policy programme that both parties could sign up to. And the negotiations that led to the one Wales government with Plaid Cymru were done in exactly that way. If, if we need to talk to other people, that's where I will want us to start. We can't reach a policy agreement. There's no point in worrying about the political underpinning for it. If we can reach a policy agreement, then, you know, the, po the politics is always a matter of will. If you want something to happen, you can make it happen. If you want to stop something happen, you always find a reason for it not to happen. Last question from us is, what do you think the, the major challenges facing Wales will be in the next five years? Well, the immediate challenge will be the recovery from the pandemic, uh, because coronavirus is not over. Uh, and even on the most benign path ahead of us, we're going to be dealing with it for the rest of this year. And the path may not be as benign as we'd like it to be, because, you know, new global variants and things we, we can't predict may, may yet make this a rockier role than any of us would like. Like, so the first part of the next Senate term is still going to be dealing with the, let's hope, let's hope it'll be the aftermath of it, but the aftermath will be very real and uh, we will have to focus on that. For me, key in that is to do everything we can to create as the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act uh, enjoins us, a more equal Wales. You know, yeah. If we're not fairer as we recover, then we're not going to be better. So I never say build back better. I always say build back fairer, because for me, that is key to it. And making sure that the opportunities that need to be there are they're equally available to all our citizens, all young people growing up, all people in black and minority ethnic communities, and so on. So that will be a huge challenge because it will be uphill. We, we will be faced with a UK government that has a completely different view uh, and, you know, the, is still gripped by the neoliberal agenda in which inequality is not an accident but a, a, a tool of policy. Uh, so that will be hard work, but it's, you know, there are things we can do and things we need to do. The climate emergency is surely the other thing that we will have to, you know, put every ounce of energy we have behind it's as urgent, if not more urgent today, than it was before the pandemic began. But for Wales, it's also a huge opportunity. You know, our natural resources are so important to us in making our contribution to the global energy challenge uh, of the future. And, you know, for 50 years, really, since the end of, since Wales stopped being, you know, a coal mining, steel producing economy. Our geography has been against us economically. We've been on the western fringe of the economic union uh, with long supply chains and you know, difficult uh, economic uh, conditions in that way. And now we have an opportunity to make our geography work for us. We're surrounded by sea on three sides. We have wind, it even rains occasionally in Wales. So all the things that you need to create a renewable energy future for us and then to capture the jobs that go with it 
I went to Holland not, not that long before the pandemic, and the Dutch government said to me, they probably didn't put it quite like this, they just couldn't believe their luck. They had put no money, no money into the R&D that's created uh, wind power and solar power, uh, and yet they have all the jobs. They are building the turbines, they are building the photovoltaics, and then selling them back to us. Uh, whereas all the R&D that lay behind it was created in, in the UK, and you know, we, we need the new energy possibility to be created here by, by all the experimental stuff we're doing, and then we need to keep the jobs here in those places and parts of Wales which badly need them and are going to be there, foundational economy jobs, jobs you can't move somewhere else in the globe that will be here to create Wales's future. Mark Drakeford, thank you very much for talking to us. Pleasure. Thank you too. Thank you for listening to Hereith. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review.